Our world says, you do you and I'll do me. That's how our world thinks about ethics, thinks about all sorts of things. In fact, the way that our world starts to think about how do we define what is good? How do you define what is ethically true? Well, they use two questions in particular. These two in particular. One, do I desire it or want it? And two, will it do any harm to anyone? And our world says, if you say yes to the first one and no to the second question, then that is ethically right. That's how our world defines whether something is good and ethically true. Do you see the issue with what our world says? It's all about me. That's why our world says, you do you, because it def I define whether I want to do something or not. I define whether it's going to harm someone or not. And the problem is, well, everyone has different definitions. And so there is no one true ethical way to do things. You do you, and I'll do me. And as we come to God's Word, and perhaps as you heard that reading from Catherine, it might start to feel hard to hear. And perhaps the reason why we find it hard to hear is because of our previous experiences. Perhaps the reason why we might find it hard to hear is perhaps, without it realising it, our culture has started to shape how we think. See, our world, with those definitions, says, who's king? I am. I get to decide what's right and what will harm people or not. And yet what we saw last week and what we heard read right at the beginning of our passage today, chapter 3, verse 17, this is is the Christian ethic. This is how God says you are to define what is right or wrong. Whatever you do, here's the ethic, whatever you do, word or deed, how are you to do it? You don't answer those two questions, you're to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, it's very important. Lordship is important. It's not just do it in the name of our Saviour Jesus, it's do it in the name of our Lord Jesus. That is, Jesus is the King, not you, not me, not our world, Jesus. And His Lordship transforms everything so that we would see that our lives following Him is to be able to give thanks to God. And so as we come to God's Word today, we're going to be reflecting on how this Lordship of Jesus transforms areas of our lives relationships in our lives. Now, some of us, we're in these relationships, for others of us, we're not, but we have people around us, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are, and this is ways in which we can think about how to encourage one another. But it is talking about what does it look like if Jesus is your Lord, your King. And so, if you're still checking out who Jesus is, again, we love that you're here, but today you get to hear how Jesus' Lordship shapes all areas of relationships, in particular, in the household. Now, it's in the household of the context of the Colossians. So, remember, Colossians, it's a church in Colossae, modern-day Turkey, but in the first century, a small town, a Roman town, full of mainly non-Jewish Gentile people, a town that Paul has never visited, a church he's never personally met, and yet he's writing to them while he's in prison, and he wants them to understand what we saw last week, that their old life, when Jesus was not their king, when they were king, that died when Jesus died. Last week we saw this in chapter 3. And then they've been raised to life again with a new life, with Jesus who's their Lord. And so he talked about put to death that old life and now live this new life that God has given you. And then in the following verses, he talks about three pairs of relationships. And now he's talking about the Christian household in Colossae. He's talked about how they are to relate to one another. Now he focuses on what's happening in the household. And in particular, for husbands, fathers, and masters, they would have all been predominantly the same person. He says, how you relate to those in your household matter. The Lordship of Jesus should transform how you relate to those reciprocal relationships. And so, as we come to this passage, it's very important for us to understand, Paul is first of all saying, men, listen. 
You might be a husband, you might be a father, you might be a master. In fact, in the Colossian church, you're going to be all three. So you need to listen carefully to what God's Word has to say. And so as we come to God's Word today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to address the men first and then the reciprocal relationships. And we're going to see this in three things. Jesus' lordship in marriage, in families, and in the work. And so let's think about that first one. Jesus' lordship in marriage. Have a look with me as we look at the husband's responsibility first. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh to them. That was countercultural in the first century. In the first century, wives did not have the same status as husbands. So for the Apostle Paul, for God's word to say to husbands, love your wives, that would have been a shock to their ears. And we go, how can that be a shock? It actually would have been. And the love here is not just this affection. It's a love that comes from God's word that we saw last week. If you've got your Bibles open, chapter 3, verse 12. But it's up on the screen as well. As God's people who are dearly loved... They're to clothe themselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. That's the new life that they're put on in relation to how they relate to everyone and particularly husbands, how you relate to your wife. You're to love them the way God has loved them. You're to treat them as equal, not as secondary. And you're not to be harsh with them. This is how the lordship of Jesus was to shape husbands relating to their wives. To put their wife above themselves. What about wives? Have a look at verse 18. Look at the wives' responsibility. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now that first part, wives, submit yourselves to husbands, that wasn't countercultural. That was expected. But the reason why was countercultural. Look at the reason why, as is fitting in the Lord. Paul says, wives, because Jesus is your Lord, you are to submit to your husband. Now, what does he mean by submit? Well, it's helpful to know that word submit there in verse 18 is a different word to verse 20, obey, and in verse 22, obey. Verse 20 and 22, same word, but it's a different word in verse 18. Now that matters because obey is a command. You have to do it. Submission is a voluntary willingness to come under someone's leadership. It's important to note that when Paul says to wives, submit yourselves to other husbands, it's the wife's choice to willingly come under, voluntarily put themselves under the leadership of their husband. But this is under the fitting for the Lord. Paul reminds them, this is your response in light of Jesus being your Lord because you're to come under Jesus' authority, first of all. To submit to Him. To willingly put your life under Him. The one who died for you and has given you new life. And it's something that Jesus doesn't call people to do without Himself doing it Himself. Many of you know, Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying that night before he's about to die, and even worse, endure the wrath of God. And as he's praying, he's praying to God, take this cup away from me, take away this wrath that I'm about to endure for the world. But in Matthew 26, he says this, verse 39, yet not what I will, but your will. Do you see, Jesus was submitting under his Father's authority. His Father's leadership. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes how Jesus will be made subject to Him, the Father. The Son is made subject to the Father. That word made subject, it's the same word in verse 18 of submit. That the Son is submitted to be under the Father's rule, the Father's leadership. Jesus is not calling people to do something that He isn't willing to do Himself. Submission isn't weak. Submission isn't forced. It's a voluntary willingness to come under someone's leadership. Jesus does that 
under the Father. God's people are to do that under Jesus. And now Paul says to wives, you're to do that willingly under your husband. But what does that mean for us? That was 21 centuries ago. How does this apply to us? Well, it's the same heart attitude. Husbands, you know in your heart the motives that drive the way that you speak, act, and think about your wife is to love them and to not speak harshly to them. And you know in your heart when you don't. And practically, that's going to look different for each of us in our marriages. But husbands, what's your heart's desire for your wife? To love them, to not speak harshly to them. One example I want to encourage husbands amongst us. Be the first to apologize to your wife when you've had an argument. Be the first to acknowledge that you, where you wronged them, your wife, where you sinned against her, and ask for forgiveness. Even if you think she started it. Lead by example. Own it, husbands. Love your wives. What about wives? Well, again, like husbands, you know, wives, in your heart, the motive that drives the way that you speak, act and think about your husband is a way that is willingly coming under his leadership and when you're not. Now, again, this is going to look practically different in each of our marriages. But wives, what's going on in your heart? Are you desiring to willingly come under the leadership of your husband? Now, practically, here's one example that this might play out. I want to encourage those of you who are wives. Speak encouragingly of your husband in public and not put him down in front of others, to ridicule in front of others, but to build him up. Now, I want to make a very important clarification as we look at this word. This passage does not mean, wives, it's fine for your husband to sin against you. This passage does not mean you can just be sinned against or cause you to sin. All domestic abuse is wicked and evil and wrong in God's sight. This passage is not to control you. That is not biblical love. That is not biblical submission. Biblical submission is a willingness to voluntarily come under your husband's leadership. It is not forced coercion. So please, if this is you, talk to someone. Talk to me, talk to Scott, talk to a Christian friend. We want to help you. It is not helpful for you to be in that situation. And husbands, I I want to encourage us again. Husbands, have a look again with me at verse 18. If you're a husband, do you notice it doesn't say, husbands, make your wife submit to you? That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to love our wives. Now, if we love our wives and are not harsh to them, it's going to be really easy for them to want to follow you. It's going to be really easy for them to want to willingly come under your leadership. So work on that. You cannot force someone to submit to you. Now, it's also important to note that this is a beautiful picture of marriage. It's a wonderful picture of marriage, where a husband is lovingly loving his wife, not speaking harsh to her, and a wife is lovingly coming under her husband's leadership. It's a beautiful picture. But many of us who are in marriages know it's not always like that. I'm coming up to 19 years of marriage to my wonderful wife, Kiralee, and I know there are many times that I sin against her. 
and there are times when she sins against me. And so actually, for marriage to work, you need to be proactive at it. It requires work, constant work. A friend of, one, friend of mine uh, shared this illustration, and I wanted to share it with you. He said, marriage is like a truck. And just go with me for a moment, okay? Marriage is like a truck, a truck that's on a hill. If you put a truck in neutral on a hill, what's going to happen? It's going to roll backwards and cause a disaster behind. So you've got to keep working at it. You can't put your marriage into neutral and think that's okay. We have to keep working at it. And so can I encourage you, those of you who are married, work at your marriage every day. It's important. Not only for you and your wife, but to avoid the carnage that would wait. And some of us have experienced that too. Here's one question I want to encourage those of you who are married to ask, well, no, not ask, to think about at, after church today. I want to encourage you. It's not a question, actually. I want you to think about uh, how can you apologize to your spouse and ask for forgiveness as husbands in the ways that you haven't loved or, or when you have spoken harshly to your wife and for wives in ways when you know in your heart you haven't willingly submitted and come under your husband's leadership. And I want to encourage you, have that conversation. And husbands, lead it. Start by apologizing first. Uh, I did this last night with Kiralee, actually. It's helpful. Keep working at our marriages. And keep working at growing in forgiving one another, which we saw last week. This is part of the new life. This is part of Lordship of Jesus in marriages. But now he turns his attention from marriages to families. And so that's what we're going to look at now. So coming back to the Apostle Paul and Colossians, he now talks about how Jesus' lordship is to be in families. And again, let's start with the man and so the father's responsibility. Have a look with me at verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Again, this is a call to fathers that is countercultural in the first century. Children were to just submit to their, their, not just obey their parents. Their fathers in particular had authority over their children. And yet God's word to fathers is actually, you don't want to embitter them. Other translations use the word, uh, discour uh, not discourage, to exasperate or to provoke. And parents, and particularly fathers, you know what that means. You know what to do to push the buttons of your kids so they end up looking like this. Right? You know what to do. Particularly dads are really good at it. It's not a good thing though, is it? To provoke our kids, to push their buttons. Because God's Word says if you do that, they will become discouraged. Discouraged to want to obey you, to listen to you, to trust you which is actually something you want them to do, which is verse 20, which we'll deal in a moment. You want your children to listen to you as you disciple them, as you point them to Jesus. So fathers, Paul says to the Colossians, take an active responsibility at leading your kids, discipling your kids. Don't abdicate this responsibility. What about children, though? Have a look with me, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now again, this, this time, this phrase, children, obey your parents, that wouldn't have been countercultural in the first century. But the reason why would have been. Did you see? The reason why is so that they can please the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Even in the first century, Paul is saying to children in the Colossian church, you can please the Lord Jesus, the one who's your king. You can live a life that pleases him, and to do it is to obey your parents. Now, it says in everything. Now, that doesn't mean everything, because in the context of chapter 3, there are things you are to put to death, the old life. But he is talking about everything in regards to under the authority of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus. Children, obey your parents. Means actually saying, 
Well, first of all, I'm seeking to obey Jesus, who's my Lord, who's my King. And in light of that, obey my parents. So what does that look like for us, particularly as parents, but also as children? Again, it's our hearts. For children who are under their parents' household, they're to seek to, in their hearts, please their Lord God, their Lord Jesus, by obeying their parents, which will be, at times, a struggle because parents won't always get it right. But parents, we do generally have more life experience, particularly as we seek to point them to Jesus. And so children, ask God to help you to trust them, to trust your parents, to be willing to obey them. And for parents, particularly fathers, it's worth asking our hearts, what's your motivation for why you want your children to obey you? Is it just so that they are obedient? Or is it so that they might grow and flourish as a disciple of Jesus? Here's three reflections I've been thinking about uh, as a dad uh, and as a father for about 14 years. Some of you are way more experienced than me in this, but I just wanted to share some of the reflections I've been thinking about as a father uh, in regards to this. So here's three things. One, uh, help your kids not just hear the rules, but understand the why. Particularly if you're trying to help them grow as a disciple of Jesus. The why is so much more important. And one of the things uh, we wrestled with as a family, uh, uh, both our kids were quite good at gymnastics, but gymnastics is quite all-consuming. And it got to the stage where we were feeling like it was consuming everything else in our lives and starting to take time both in our family lives but also in our time for them to be growing in Jesus. Time for them to be spending time with their friends to grow in Jesus, spending time in God's Word with others. And having that difficult discussion with them of saying, we're not going to do gymnastics anymore. It was hard. And we could have just said, we're not doing it. But actually, we wanted to try and help our kids understand the why. That while gymnastics is great and fun, and there's other things that are great and fun, gathering with God's people and letting that shape our lives is more important. And there's going to be times when we're going to have to make sacrifices in all sorts of ways in our lives. And here's one moment. And part of what we're trying to help our kids do is realize that was the hard, but understand the why. And there's going to be other times in your life as you keep growing up that's going to be hard and help them understand the why so that when they're adults, they can work out the why themselves and work out what it looks like for them. It's not easy. It's hard. But I'm trying to disciple our kids to love Jesus and Him as Lord, not just obey me. Secondly, uh, parents and especially fathers, be present with your kids. I find this particularly challenging. Uh, and even as I'm saying it, I'm like, I feel like I'm rebuking myself. Uh, because I can either come home and I've just, I'm in my head, and particularly uh, dads, you can just be in your head when you get home. Or even when I'm clear enough to go, okay, I pray about it before I walk in the door, be present, be present, and I'm in present, and I'm having dinner with the family, we'll talk, and then I just like, oh, I'm done. And I'll just go to the couch and zonk out. And I'm not present anymore. Parents, and particularly fathers, you have limited time with your children. You have limited time to disciple them, to guide them, to encourage them. Don't squander it. It's a privilege. And thirdly, our kids need both discipline and encouragement. They need both to flourish as followers of Jesus. And so as we think about how to both discipline and encourage them, the framework I want us to keep thinking about is how do we help them grow in Jesus? Because that's what matters most of all, doesn't it? That eternal destination. 
And they're going to have to work out all those different things in life, but we want them to be able to grow in not working out how to... The eternity matters more. Following Jesus matters more. And how we model that to them, they will see. In the way we speak, the way we act, the decisions we make, and what we show them which is movable and which aren't. That's not easy. But what's our heart's desire? For them to grow in Jesus and receive that eternal inheritance or the things of this world that fade and perish. Paul talks about Jesus' lordship in marriage, Jesus' lordship in families, and then he turns his attention to Jesus' lordship in work. And I'm just going to spend the shortest amount of time in here, but let's again look at the men's role first. Uh, Look with me, chapter 4, verse 1, masters, masters' responsibility. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Again, this is countercultural. In the first century, slaves were treated as objects and possessions, not people. And yet God's word is saying to Christian masters, you're to look after your slaves. And the reason why? He reminds them, you have a master in heaven. The same word, master, Lord. It's Jesus. He's your Lord, Christian masters. And how did your Lord treat you? Not with what is right and fair, but what's not right and fair. He gave you forgiveness. He's given you new life. You didn't deserve that, and yet he's given it to you so much so that, masters, treat your slaves with dignity, that they are people, not possessions. But then what about slaves? Well, slaves, verse 22, talks about their fact that they are to the, obey their earthly masters. Now, that wasn't countercultural, but what was, was the reason why. Look again, the reason why was, verse 22, not to please their masters, but because they were seeking to, verse 22, please the Lord. That whatever they did, they were working, verse 23, working for the Lord first. And verse 24, because you will receive an inheritance. Now, that's a big deal for slaves. Slaves weren't entitled to an inheritance. And yet God's word was saying, you're a follower of Jesus, you get an inheritance, an eternal inheritance that we saw back in chapter 1, verse 12. An inheritance of the kingdom of light. And so, slaves, in your hearts, work remembering you are serving your Lord Jesus, not your earthly Masters and Lords. Well, what does it mean for us? Because the slavery here is very different to the slavery uh, that we see and are horrified by. Slavery where people are sold into slavery, forced into slavery. And that was true. Some in the first century were forced into slavery. But also, many were voluntarily putting themselves under slavery. In the first century, that was a way to pay off a debt. Or if you were in famine or unable to provide for yourself, you would come under a master. There was no social services there, and so you would come under a master. And so there's a voluntary aspect to slavery. But it's not the same as what we're talking about with work, for instance. A master and slave relationship is not the same as an employer and an employee relationship. But there is some similarities when it comes to what's happening in our hearts. And so that's what I want to think about. What's happening in our hearts? For those of us who are employers, bosses, managers, we're reminded, like the masters of chapter 4, verse 1, we have a heavenly master. And so we are to treat those who work under us with dignity, to not abuse the power and authority that we've been given. And for those of us who are employees, we're reminded your heart's desire is to work not to please your boss or the company, but the Lord Jesus. Whether your boss is work, looking at you or not, and you know, even less so with working from home. But that in our hearts, 
We are seeking to be diligent at our work for the Lord. We are seeking to be fulfilling our role because we are serving the Lord Jesus first. And that shapes our motives. But it also means that when we work, and we might be doing work that might feel meaningless, menial, boring, unpaid, difficult, there's a reminder. Our work is for the Lord. This is a life transformed by the Lordship of Jesus. And it takes time. As we saw last week in chapter 3, verse 10, we are, the new life that we've been given in Jesus, as we trust in Him, we are being renewed in the image of our Creator. That idea of renewed isn't an instantaneous thing. It's a slow, constant progression. That's what's happening for those who trust in Jesus as their Lord. We are being made more and more in the likeness of our great God to model and mirror His characteristics in our lives and particularly in these specific relationships. And so I want to finish with just reminding us again. Our world says, you do you. You're the king of your life. And yet our God says, no, Jesus is the king of our life. He is our Lord. And so whatever we do, we're seeking to be thankful for Jesus' lordship. And so let's look again at chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Our Lord shapes our relationships, in particular in our marriages, in our families, in our workplace. And actually, this is something we can thank God for. And so let me lead us in a time of prayer. Father God, we come to you thanking you for the Lord Jesus, that He is King. And we pray that you would continue to help transform our lives and our hearts to let His Lordship shape all areas of our life and relationships. Please forgive us for the ways that as husbands we have not loved our wives or we have spoken harshly towards them. Father, please forgive us for those of us who are wives and have not wanted to willingly come under our husband's leadership. Father, forgive us as parents and as fathers who've exasperated our children and forgive us as children who've not obeyed our parents. Father, forgive us for the times when we have not treated those who work under us with dignity or when we have not worked in a way that pleases you Father, we thank you that in your Son we are forgiven. We thank you that in your Son you've given us new life. And we thank you that in your Son he transforms us. And so work in our hearts, Lord. Shape us to be more like your Son. Help us to see the bigger picture and see the joy that it is that Jesus is our King, our Lord, and we live in thankfulness to him. And so we pray, Father, work in us for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.